911. What's the address of the emergency? Hi, I'm at um, Cherokee One apartment or condo complexes in Aurora. That night, there were two people that were hired by the apartment complex to just look at the cars, make sure everybody that was parked there was supposed to be there. And they did have a camera in their car. And so as they're patrolling the neighborhood, they do hear the gunshots. And what you can see from the dash camera is a white SUV that ran into a cement post in front of a garage. And this is what's reported on the 911 call. There's um, two people in the car here. We're going to check on them, but they both look like they've been shot. Um, I think they're both un unresponsive. It doesn't look like there's any movement. Keep the door open. John, take the other one. Yeah, I got him. The officers are looking around, trying to see and, and to document appropriately everything that they're observing. Does it look self-inflicted? There's no broken glass. One of the officers had written in his report that the, the two victims were holding hands when he got there. Joe and Jocelyn roll under my parents. Jocelyn and my dad have been married since I was four, and I was 17 when they died. So, I mean, every memory that I have with my dad, I have with her. My dad was a best dad. Yeah, my dad was my best friend. We liked to work on cars together. He would peruse the apps and find cars. He would work on them, and I was the detailer, and it was a great bonding activity for us. I am a chief deputy district attorney at the 18th DA's office. And so we work very close with the major crimes unit of the Aurora Police Department anytime there's a homicide. I got the call probably about an hour after the actual murder. The two victims, Joseph and Jocelyn Rowland, had already been carried away. Once the ambulance is gone, we try to canvas to see if there's any video. And that's where new technology is coming into play because everyone has a surveillance camera, whether it's a residence, whether it's a business, whether it's a pole camera on the side of the street, there's cameras everywhere. We were able to contact a man who did have the ring doorbell. When I was looking at the video that night, there were two vehicles that were involved. One of them was a, a dark colored SUV, and it had some very distinctive rims on it. The other vehicle was the Rollins vehicle. The driver of the dark SUV exits and walks back towards the white SUV where the two victims were seated. There's a conversation. You couldn't hear any of the conversation that was going on. What you could hear, though, is five distinct gunshots. Detectives also locate a white Bank of America envelope, and there was $1,300 cash in there. Written on the front of the envelope was the number five and the letter K, and that means to me that there should have been $5,000 in that envelope. I don't know why there was money left behind, but we know that this was a robbery. We didn't have a lot of information to go on at that point, but we did find a phone in the car. Not only has the use of the cell phones evolved, but what we're able to access from these companies is also evolving and changing. Whereas before, we would use a cell phone to make a phone call or to send a text message. Now we're using a cell phone almost as more of a portable computer. And so that's kind of influencing the way that we're investigating crime. We had a conversation with Madison, and she tells us that her dad has a hobby, that he buys and sells cars on the side and uses resale apps like Let Go, like Craigslist. Madison told me he was buying a blue RAV4 on Let Go. And now we've narrowed it down to not only what application Joseph was using, but what kind of car he's looking at buying. I call Andy McDermott, and he's known for his experience with digital data. 
our motivation is, let's bring justice to the family that was impacted by this. When we review that conversation log between the suspect in this case and the victim, we identify the IP address that was used by the suspect, and we find that it's issued by Verizon Wireless. An IP address is the number to identify specific devices that connect to a network. The next step is to find out what device on the Verizon network was using the IP address during the time of the interaction on Letco. So I contact Verizon and request this data immediately. But then also, there was a Google Gmail address that was used to set up the Letco account. So I also requested subscriber information from Google. The Verizon IP address that was used to access the Letco account was an older version. And these older versions of IP addresses are in different markets simultaneously. So I learned that we're gonna receive about 164 different phone numbers that accessed this IP address. There could be someone in Aurora, Colorado who's using this Verizon IP address to access Letco and communicate with our victim. At the same time, someone in Vermont could be using that same IP address to watch a movie online. But at the same time, Google returned information back to us related to the Gmail address that was used to set up the Letco account. They were able to supply a phone number and a name. And so then the ball's rolling much quicker. The name associated with that account was Kyrie Brown. I have the number used to set up Kyrie Brown's Google account, so I compare it to the list of 164 numbers that use the IP address, and that number exists in that list. I think Joseph Rowland and, and Jocelyn were trying to play it safe when they were buying something off Let Go, but they let their guard down, I think, when they saw Kyrie Brown. He was 18 years old. He had turned 18 just a few months prior to the murders. Just because someone looks like they're nice and looks like they're not going to do anything to you doesn't mean that's the case. There were little things that Kyrie would admit to. And so he initially admitted to being at the shooting, but it was just supposed to be a robbery, that it wasn't supposed to be a shooting. Then tried to say he wasn't the one that actually shot the gun. And that's when my partner was able to say, based on the video, we know there weren't two people there. Eventually, Kyrie confessed to the shooting of the Rollins. As the car is rolling down the street and approaching that garage, Kyrie reaches into the console and that's when he takes the money that Joseph had kind of laid out on his lap as he's trying to facilitate the deal for the car. And Kyrie claimed that shooting Jocelyn was an accident, that he didn't mean to. But he fired five rounds into a car at relatively close range where two people were sitting, accidental or not. Kyrie, you shot two people and you killed them. After that, he runs back to the RAV4 and he drives the car up to the other street and he lights the car on fire and he runs away. The technology and the evidence that we had had really boxed him in to what actually happened in this case. And he had nothing left to do but tell us the truth. The jury ultimately returned a verdict of guilty. Kyrie Brown was convicted of two counts of first-degree murder. So the sentencing happened a few months later. It was a particularly heart-wrenching sentencing. Murder cases are tough in the sense that there is no way to make the victim's family whole again. At the end of the day, the defendant was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murder of Joseph Rowland and then he was sentenced to a consecutive life in prison without the possibility of parole for Jocelyn Rowland. <laughs>